are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. This is Brad Adams. Uh, if you've been on these before, you probably recognize me. I am the current chair for TNHFMA for the website, um, as well as I'm a project manager for Diagnostic Labs at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Um, and I am going to be your moderator and host today. Uh, we've got a pretty, pretty timely topic, I think, for everybody. And we are going to be talking about uh, protecting your revenue and optimizing your reimbursement, um, and particularly focusing on denials. So our speaker today is Carlene Dietrich. Carlene is the founder of MedRev Solutions. Um, and so this is a company that provides claim recovery and specialized appeal services. Uh, she is a healthcare consultant, frequent speaker, um, and appeal specialist. She is certified in billing and coding. She has over 30 years of healthcare and billing management experience um, on the, both the provider and as a consultant. Um, so pretty excited to have her here with us today. Um, let me knock out a couple of housekeeping things real quick. Um, if you've got questions throughout the presentation, feel free to type them into the questions box. Um, and then I can, you know, if it's a technical question or something, I can just go ahead and answer it. Or if it's a question for Carleen, um, I can go ahead and bring that up. Um, when the time's right, we will pause. Um, we'll take time at the end uh, for, for any other questions that you've got. And one of the options we do have there is if you raise your hand, um, then I can unmute you if you've got audio set up. And that way, uh, you can go ahead and ask your question. And it's just like being um, at a conference, which is pretty nice. Um, slide deck. Um, the slide deck's available on our website. If you just go back, uh, there should be a link in the chat. And if that doesn't work, if you just go to tnhfma.org, then under education, um, you can pick webinars. And you'll see the link for today's webinar. And you can download the slide deck from there. Um, so without further ado, I am going to turn it over to our speaker, uh, Carlene, take it away. Thank you, Brad. Um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, I wanted to talk to you today about how to optimize your insurance reimbursement. I know in this day and time, insurance reimbursement has never been more vital or challenging to all of us. And I hope to, in the next hour, hour and a half, help you become more aware of some of the payer compliance requirements that they don't typically like for you to know. So we'll get started. Um, the first question it would to ask yourself is, are you getting paid what you're supposed to uh, in network? A lot of times what I see is you're getting shortchanged uh, rather than getting paid what your fee schedules are. Another area, of course, is out of network. And although many providers are in network, there are still a lot of providers out there that have some out of network um, business going. And the way the federal law reads is, and I'll show you this a little bit later on, is that if it's, it should be based on bill charges and not based on a UCR uh, concept. So, the bottom line with that is, you know, you need to monitor your reimbursement, whether you're using the variance type program or some kind of matrix, uh, and periodically check in to monitor your reimbursement to make sure you're getting paid what you're entitled to be paid under a contract or out of network. Now, insurance companies are denial savvy. They have been watching us for a very long time, and they know um, how your facility or practice uh, provides follow-up as it relates to a denial or delay. They know those that, you know, are um, immediately write something off or those that fight it and to what level they fight it. They're highly automated. Um, they also know that we can typically limit patient involvement because we don't want to upset the patient. But there's a lot of times we need to let the patients know what is going on because typically when I talk with someone and they find out what I do for a living, they say, oh, I have the best insurance in the world. They pay everything. Well, that's because we as providers have never uh, kept them updated or informed them that, yes, we are having some problems getting the claims paid. 
So it does sometimes, uh, you know, benefit you to get the patient involved. Now, provider contracts are a very touchy area because a lot of times those in the billing area are not able to actually see the contracts and know the specific provisions and, and things that you sometimes need to know or be aware of uh, with the reimbursement side of it. Uh, communication breakdowns, if, depending on how large your company is or facility is, uh, that brings additional, you know, the larger it is, the more communication breakdown you have in the revenue cycle process. Lack of tracking, many uh, providers do not track denials or refunds or offsets, and that's an area that the insurance companies are very well aware of, and they do typically take advantage of that. Now, last but not least is turnover. We in the medical field, as you all know, have probably one of the highest turnovers. Uh, and they know that. So if you have an employee that's on the ball and, and on top of things, they will, and that has um, minimized a certain denial tactic or stopped a certain denial tactic, they'll recycle that in about six months or so to see if that person is still there and basically as a test for you. So these are all areas that, that we're being monitored and, and that they're aware of. Now the creative stall tactics, as we well know, whether contracted or not contracted, include payment denials, unreasonable delays, underpaying claims, misrepresentation of policy coverage. Now what necessarily do you mean by that is let's say you call to verify benefits on a patient or someone a department called to verify benefits on a patient, was told patients covered, provides the benefits, you render the service, and then after the fact, uh, file a claim and it has been informed that the patient was not covered on the date of service. Or you receive a refund request six months, two years down the road that it's a retroactive denial. And we're going to cover uh, some of that. but. Um, or if you've been told that um, benefits are not covered when actually they are covered if deemed medically necessary. Of course, refund requests and recoupments are uh, denials. They're just retroactive denials. Now, incentives to deny benefits. Insurers do have incentives um, that include management, and employees who, it is, it is not uncommon for management and employees to receive financial incentives for savings, or better known to us as providers as claim denials and refunds. You will typically see a higher number of refund requests and claim denials during periods of an insurance company's unexpected or even expected financial loss. A good example of this is last year when the Affordable Care Act was upheld in June, um, that meant that the insurers had to, beginning in August, pay back rebates to insurers who, and employers who, uh, when the insurer did not uh, meet the 80% premium limitation for uh, wellness and health care benefits. Uh, I had a lot of people comment, or I, had, I saw myself, uh, a lot of refund requests during that time frame. And claim denial, the claim denial volume seemed to increase a little bit. And that's something I typically see uh, when there's maybe fines involved with the insurer or something to that effect. So that's just something to keep in mind when you start seeing an abundance of refund requests and claim denials. If you want to research it, you may find that uh, either their earnings are down for the quarter prior to that, or they have been hit with some kind of unexpected financial loss. And as I said, that's the way it impacts us as, as providers is we get all the, in, the denials and the um, um, uh, claim denials and refund requests. Now, in order to have a good denial management program, a good recycle, uh, revenue cycle program, we need good quality denial management tools. And as part of that, um, we'll cover the assignment of benefits here in a minute a little bit more in detail, but we do need a valid assignment of benefits. 
pre-authorization and pre-certification uh, pro processes, verification of benefit processes, supportive documentation, which includes meeting medical necessity requirements as well as good documentation of pre-certification and verification of benefit calls. Uh, if you're not printing off or, or doing online eligibility. And even with online eligibility, you need to be sure to have a way of copying and saving the information that you have uh, obtained to that guarantees benefit coverage and um, benefits and coverage. Make sure if you're talking with someone on the phone, uh, whether it's through for pre-authorization or pre-cert, that you get the first name and last initial of that insurance representative because how many Lindas work at Cigna, you know, that kind of thing. And you can also ask uh, who their manager's name is. A lot of times they don't want to give you their last name, but they'll definitely give you the manager's last name, first name and last name. Uh, and the importance of the documentation when you're dealing with verification of benefits and authorization is it can become a very important piece of evidence in your appeal process. An example of that is uh, several years back I worked for a particular hospital, which is a long-term acute care hospital, and we had a patient that was admitted, you know, let's say in November. The patient was discharged three months later, and throughout the whole process we obtained the verification of benefits, the pre-certification through the whole, throughout the whole hospitalization. Well, at the end, when we filed the claim, we received a denial because the insurance company had gone back and retroactively termed the benefits prior to the hospitalization, just a couple of days prior to the hospitalization. Uh, in doing the research to appeal this, I lacked one piece of information that I needed, and that was the person's name who uh, provided the verification of benefits to that particular department that obtained it. And uh, on a whim, I contacted the insurance company. Uh, luckily, the person on the other end started reading the notes to me. And as she read, I kept my mouth shut and started writing. And in that, there, uh, in what the conversation, what she did was provide me with all the information I needed. Uh, we were able to appeal that and get that overturned. And as you can well guess, three months worth of um, hospitalization was covered and paid, and that's a lot of money. So um, claim scrubbers are great tools to assist uh, in the denial management. And then another key area is clinical rationale. If you are providing high dollar, high volume cases, or you have uh, a, a medical necessity or authorization appeal that you need to, to submit, it would benefit to uh, copy your clinical rationale from the website of the insurer related to that specific uh, treatment, and that has been very useful in the past. Um, of course, applicable laws, which we will cover uh, a few of those due to the time limit, can't cover all of them, but you know we are able to cover a couple in this presentation. Now. Uh, now's the time, Brad, to show the first poll question. All right, so our first poll question for today. Does the assignment of benefits being used for your facility or practice allow for A, payment of insurance benefits only, B, insurance payment and the right to appeal claim denial, or C, you don't know? Um, so let's give this a minute, get get some responses in from folks. And I would have to say not not being in our business office here, I honestly don't know the question. Um, the answer to this question for Vanderbilt. So all right, we were at about sixty percent of the people have answered, so let's give it another couple seconds like to get that up to 75% or so, it gets us a good sample. All right, so I am going to close the poll. 
and share the results. So we can see here about 60% of, of the folks on here um, said that the insurance payment and the right to appeal claim denials um, is allowed. That's great. Uh, that's a great uh, number because typically when I start working with a client, uh, the first thing I'll ask for is a copy of their assignment of benefits. And the typical assignment of benefits that I find fails to protect your facility or practice um, in some areas, including the right of appeal. Um, what, I, what I do see as a rule is something to, the, um, something to the effect of, I authorize and direct all entitled plan benefits for services rendered to be paid directly to ABC Hospital. I authorize provider uh, ABC Hospital to release medical records and documents necessary to receive payment for services rendered. And this kind of assignment of benefits does not protect the facility and practice other than to receive payment and release records. Uh, the federal uh, governing bodies now require a, a valid assignment of benefits uh, in order to appeal for uh, any claim denial, whether they're pre-service or post-service. And what needs to be included in your valid assignment of benefits is uh, the statement that is underlined, which says, for the sole purpose of receiving all entitled benefits and rights of appeal to under my health and welfare benefit plan or applicable Social Security Act, as well as any federal, city, or state government program for services rendered in good faith. Something to that effect. Um, I authorize all rights to me under my health benefit plan, including all rights of appeal, and to receive any applicable relevant plan documents, remedies, disclosures, administrative reviews, and litigation on my behalf. Uh, that's something that, you know, you can have your health care attorney put together for you, um, but it does need to include the right of appeal. Uh, otherwise, you're taking the appeal rights away from the patient if you have not been authorized to appeal on their behalf. Are appeals currently being done in your facility? Um, and if so, uh, what, space, what specific category of denials do you appeal? Uh, payment denials, unreasonable delays, uh, misrepresentation of policy coverage, refund requests, um, and on and on with that, underpayment. Who handles the denials? Is this done by each individual collector, or do you have a separate a department that handles uh, appeals? A lot of times I, I've been, you know, I'm aware that a uh, clinical side might handle pre-service of denials, whereas the uh, business office might handle the claim denials. So that's just an internal um, process that's put together by your specific facility. Do you have a denial management type committee? What is, oh, I'm sorry, um, what is your appeal process? Um, and are appeals followed up? And at what point do you write off a balance? Um, do you have a denial management type committee that uses denials as a means of evaluating your revenue cycle, internal educational needs, problem employees, and handling of creative insurance denial tactics? Um, another thing to think about is do you see the same type of denials across the board by payers, or do you see different payers relying on their own creative denial tactics? Typically, if you see the same denial across the board, there may be an internal process problem, whether it be documentation, coding, or billing process that needs to be looked at uh, and possibly addressed. If you see a payer-specific related denial delay, uh, then the problem may be more external than internal, and these are the kind of things a denial management type committee might be able to evaluate and address. So now is our next poll question.
All right, so what percentage of claims do you have over and above the Medicare and Medicaid that qualify as an URSA-based claim? So A, 15%, B, 30%, C, 55%, and D, 80%. So we'll give this about 20 more seconds. We're at about a third of the people have, have submitted an answer. And I can kind of see the answers as they come in, so it's interesting because they keep fluxing back and forth. We don't have uh, a, clear, a clear response, you know, across the board. It's pretty even. All right, so give it just another second. All right, and it was uh, pretty even, 38% said 15%, 38% said 30%, and a quarter of folks who answered said approximately 55% um, qualify as an ERSA-based claim. Okay, let's first talk about what ERISA is. ERISA is the Employee Retirement Security Act. Um, governed by the federal government, it's a federal government program, and it's a it basically is any coverage that a private employer group provides uh, to their employees. If they have, if they provide one dollar toward that coverage, then it is falls under ERISA. Now that includes your fully insured plans, your self-insured plans, and any HRAs that are employer-based. This is an area that insurance companies typically uh, like to just fall back on self-insured rather than um, <clears throat> the fully insured, which also qualify under ERISA. And the answer to the poll question is, Unless you're in a rural area with a large payer mix of Medicare and Medicaid, approximately 80% of claims would fall under ERISA that are over and above your Medicare and Medicaid. And you, why is this important to you? Because these claims are governed under uh, federal laws as well as some state laws. Now typically when you're dealing with an insurance company, they always like to refer back to policy, um, and, you know, as determined by, let's say, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, as determined by Cigna, as determined by, uh, you know, Aetna. However, we also have what's called a plan that it applies to claims. And what a plan is, is when an employee um, goes to work for a company, and that company provides benefits to that employee, that is a contract between the employee and the company. Now, it is also the same contract between the company and the insurance company. So that is called your plan. The important thing to consider here is which one rules, the plan or the policy. Well, the plan rules. So. If the, if the insurance company's policy is one way, but the plan says something else, the plan overrides that policy. And that's important to know, and that's why sometimes it's, it's beneficial to get the employee involved to get a copy of their plan to see if uh, a benefit should have been paid versus denied based on a policy. Now, ERISA does not apply to government, schools, church, or individual plans. However, effective 9-23-2010, we have what's called the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And even though the government, school, church, and individual plans do not fall under ERISA, what the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act did was adopt ERISA in its entirety plus other standards. And because of that being the case, the government, school, and church, and individual plans uh, falling under P, it's called PPAC, as the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, they do then have coverage under the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, 
as the sign top coverage or governing cover laws as ERISA. So the ERISA laws apply, but they apply through the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Now this is the time that I need to let you know I'm not an attorney and I don't play one on TV. And I am not providing legal advice here. I am merely providing an educational presentation that includes and provides you with awareness of the laws that apply to payer compliance. Um, the awareness of these laws pertaining to payer compliance can be used in your appeal process. So. Uh, this is not a poll question, but one for you to think about. When do insurance companies first notify us they are likely to deny benefits? How many of you have heard this statement before? This is not a guarantee of payment. And they're right. When you're calling to verify benefits, it's when you hear this statement for the first time, uh, along with the authorization process. But um, it, and they're right. They know what to say, and they're guided uh, in what to say and when to, and how to say it. So when you're calling and verifying benefits, it is not a guarantee a guarantee of payment, but it is a guarantee of coverage and benefits that they provide. And this is shown through what's called a promissory and equitable estoppel. Um, which is the doctrine allowing recovery on a promise made without consideration when the reliance on the promise was reasonable and the promise he relied on it to his or her detriment. So basically you relied on what they told you and you were harmed as, uh, as a result of the reliance. Equitable estoppel is basically the same thing except that there is some intended deception on the part of the party providing the information and um, that is false, and, it, and you are misled to some injury or damage. Intended deception meaning that who was in the best position to know the information when it was provided. You can utilize court cases in your appeal um, because it just shows there's case law out there that applies. Um, one of the areas in the Meadows versus employers health insurance, uh, some of the decisions included in that and some other court cases were that estoppel applies because you relied upon information provided in rendering the services to the patient, which is their insured or member, and you were damaged as a result of that information. Um, it is fraudulent misrepresentation of material factor relevant policy provisions in connection with a claim was provided as a result of the false information you received. And the thing you need to ask yourself is um, how would benefits have been administered, I mean how would you have handled the case if you were given accurate coverage information on the day you called to verify benefits? It could also be a breach of your contract, um, so that's something that you might want to look at as a possibility. Now, effective 9-23-2012, uh, we have a new uh, standard uh, for the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act and it is called the SBC, which is the Summary of Benefits Coverage. Prior to that, it was kind of like a no tell, no lie kind of thing. Unless you asked specifically, they didn't have to provide you with specific coverage information. However, effective 9-23-2012, under the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, uh, Standard 2715, they are required to provide you with what's considered a four-page mini SPD. And as part of that, and it includes your deductible, coinsurance, that kind of thing, but it, it also is supposed to summarize for you the covered benefits, uh, cost sharing provisions, coverage limitations and exceptions, and a glossary of terms that help you provide a better understanding of the language. 
and it is supposed to be a, uh, provided upon request, along with some other guidelines uh, that they have. But for us providers, it's at, at any time upon request if you have a valid assignment of benefits. Now, when you're dealing with the verification of benefits and benefits have been denied due to eligibility or retroactive denial, uh, one other standard under the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act uh, clearly states plans and issuers cannot rescind coverage unless an individual was involved in fraud or made an intentional misrepresentation of material fact. This standard applies to all recensions, whether in the group or individual insurance market and whether insured or self-insured coverage applies. So these rules also apply regardless of any contestability period that may otherwise apply. So this is a good appeal um, tool to use uh, if you have some eligibility type uh, refund, re retroactive denials, or claim denials. Now another area that is typically included in a contract involves untimely filing penalties. And I am going to show you a little later how you can actually use your contract to um, protect yourself in in the area in some of these areas. But um, the insurance company provides a penalty uh, for untimely filing, which is non-payment. Well, you have what's called a right of disclosure, meaning that you have the right to uh, ask and obtain certain information. And one of those is how was the insurer damaged or prejudiced as a result of claim filing timelines? Because as you well know, they cannot provide any proof of damage or prejudice. In fact, they typically make money on a delay of, of claim filing due to interest. Is it an entitled benefit under the plan? Remember when we talked about the plan and the policy? Is it an entitled benefit under the plan? And typically, untimely filing is more of a policy and not a plan issue. And what regulatory guideline allows you to withhold an entitled benefit under the plan? So these are all disclosure rights that you have, uh, questions that you have a right to receive from the insurance company. And here's a court case that kind of supports this, is um, the court case decisions show that insurers may not refuse to process a claim due solely to the lack of timely filing unless the insurer can prove that it was substantially prejudiced by the late filing. And again, you can use case law in your appeals. Now here's the ERISA law applicable to uh, lack of timely filing. And it clearly says a plan's claim procedure must be reasonable and not contain any provision or be administered in any way that unduly inhibits or hampers the initiation or processing of claim for benefits. Adoption of a period of time for filing claims that serves to unduly limit claimants' reasonable good faith efforts to make claims for and obtain benefits under the plan would violate this requirement. So as you can see, that's where the case law comes from, and that's where your rights um, for the disclosure uh, come from. Now how many of you feel like this? I'm sure all of us that deal with re insurance reimbursement I have seen this on many occasions, or felt like this on many occasions. So, Tennessee has a, we're talking about state and federal laws here, and some of you may already be aware of this, but I wanted to show you um, uh, some comparisons. But, so the prompt payment requirement for Tennessee is 30 days for paper claims and 21 days for electronics. Uh, if the claim is considered a claim claim. So that's one of the parts that you will need to consider in the law is how to determine whether it's a claim claim. Now, <clears throat> here's an area for the poll question.
Okay, let me bring that up. Does your facility or practice typically request interest for claims not paid within 21 or 30 days as applicable to the prompt pay? So, yes, no, or don't know. And now, Carlene, you're probably going to talk about this later, but one of the things, you know, I'm curious to see how it folds out, you know, in a little over a year's time is how this is going to tie in with ICD-10 and if we were going to see any delays in, in payments just due to insurance companies, systems not quite being ready or things not working as, as planned on their end when we do submit clean claims. I do see that this will be just another, if nothing else, excuse. Um, and some valid, some invalid. But again, the laws still apply. And you, you know, that that's an area that um, we're all going to have an adjustment. But the laws do protect the providers. So the, the, this would be something, you know, probably if you're not, as we see here from from the survey results. 67% of, of the folks who responded, you know, they are not typically requesting interest. Might be something you want to start doing ahead of ICD-10, so that way you can you can show. Oh, we've all, we've been doing this since well before ICD-10. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you have a right to it, and and although it doesn't sound like much, and for some people, depending on the size of your claim, it can be a lot. But the benefit of interest is it's gravy money. It's not applied to the patient account. It's typically separate from the patient account, and I call it gravy money. It's uh, money that you know that definitely benefits. But along with that, it um, uh, you know it it's a, per, a persuasion tool for them to pay because the the one thing they're not wanting to do is to pay additional money. They try to get by with, like we talked before, savings. And if you are uh, assertive in requesting the uh, insurance penalties, not only do you benefit financially from it, but you also let them know that you understand what their guidelines are and what they must comply with. And it just helps to hold them accountable. Makes now let's talk sense. about. Let's oh. talk about. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say thank you for answering my question. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about um, prompt pay under ERISA. Uh, one of the things that I enjoy uh, from time to time is challenging the insurance representatives on the phone. And um, when you have one on the phone and you start quoting, you know, the state's prompt pay laws. And they say, well, this doesn't apply because it's a self-insured plan. And my response is typically, um, really? So what you're telling me now is you are failing to comply with federal law because for ERISA and self-insured, it is 30 days. Um, and, and, and a lot of times what you start hearing is a lot of backpedaling and um, 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 um you know, but ERISA, the claims that fall under self-insured and ERISA, um, the prompt pay is 30 days. And um, a lot of people are not aware that there is interest for self-insured plans. It's not necessarily the state interest. It is the, um, an interest set by the Treasury Department and the federal interest rate is uh, the current federal interest rate is 1.75 percent per month, and what I typically let them know is yes, we do have an interest rate for prompt pay for federal. It is set by the Treasury Department, and the current rate is, and like I say right now, currently it is 1.75 percent per month. And I ask them to go ahead and note it in their system along with the other information relating to the claim that we would like interest paid on the claim based on the federal interest rate prompt pay interest rate. Uh, and as far as that goes, the Treasury Department changes the federal interest rate every six months with effective dates on January 1st and July 1st. Uh, it is also important to note that managed Medicare plans and traditional Medicare plans are not exempt from that same federal prompt pay interest rate. So you can hold them accountable as well to that 
comp pay interest rate. Now here are the claim and appeal decision time frames uh, related to the risk of claims. Urgent claims is three days, pre-service claims 15 days, and post-service being our claims filed after service is rendered is 30 days. For appeals, the time frame is, again, for urgent claims thir three, three days, pre-service claims 30 days, and post-service claims 60 days. So if you submitted an appeal and you haven't heard from them in 60 days, uh, and typically what you will see if they need additional information, they have to notify you within 45 days, which gives them an additional 15 days. And that's why they let you know they need to get the information back timely, because they know the guidelines that they must follow. So let's talk about refund requests. There are two times when refunds are required. One is adjustment enrichment. When you were paid um, for, let's say, you were paid a check that was for me and I never came into your facility. That is called unjust enrichment. Or you were paid twice for the same claim. Uh, let's say you were paid, you know, one amount and then the second check came in with a higher amount. Which one are you required to refund? Um, that you've only been unjustly enriched for the lower amount. Um, but if there's a contract applicable, that's that's an internal decision that needs to be made. As I can guarantee you they're going to ask for the higher amount of the two. The other uh, situation that you definitely are required to refund is when fraud is involved. Now, when are you not required to refund is when um, services were rendered in good faith and you were paid and then later asked to return the money. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and when the insurance company was in the best position to know how the claim should have been processed and paid when it was paid. And again, let's go back to, is it an entitled benefit under the governing plan? That's a question that you need to consider when a refund request has been made. Carleen, let, so me, are, let sure. me pause here. We've got a couple of uh, audience uh, questions that I want to get to real quick, or have you get to. I couldn't be the one to answer these, obviously. Uh, first one, uh, is it your opinion that if a claim is denied as not clean and the information is provided that makes it a clean claim, does the clock start ticking again with the 30-day prompt pay? Yes. So, so once we submit a clean claim, 30 days, clock starts ticking again. They've got 30 yes. days to adjudicate. Okay, great. Right. All because right. the law specifically says clean claim. Great. All right. That's and my opinion. Nope, I would I would tend to agree with you on that one. Um, so this next question is um, wanting to know: Do you have any example letters of different types of appeals that we've discussed here that you could share? Uh, they would love to see uh, where you have actually quoted case law as well as the prompt pay interest laws. I do have those. Um, they are a. It's something that I sell, though. Okay. I have a book of them. <laughs> that, that is a proprietary product. Uh, so, yeah. so, so if you ask that question, uh, you can definitely connect up with uh, Carlene at a, at a later time and find out more. All right. That, those, are the, those are the questions we've got in so far. Those are both great questions. Uh, thank you. Keep them coming in. Okay. Um, some things to consider with the refund requests. We've already gone over these before. Um, as you kind of see, you can probably see a pattern here. You're dealing with promissory and equitable estoppel again because you relied on the information they provided to your detriment. And you want to think about it this way as well. Um, let's say you get a claim in and it shows your payment and patient responsibility. And so you bill the patient, patient pays their portion, and then six months, a year, two years down the line, you receive a refund request because benefits were recalculated, which results in you paying back a portion of the money and the patient being held responsible for an additional amount. 
what's going to happen when you bill that patient? Well, the patient is not going to be very happy with you as a provider, even though the insurance company is the one that made the changes. So that's where promissory and equitable estoppel may apply. Um, there's going to be another area. I'll show you something else that would apply to that as well. Uh, misrepresentation of material facts. Again, they were in the best position to know how that claim should have been processed and paid when it was paid. And, you know, again, it could be a possible breach of your contract. So that's some things to consider when you receive refund requests. And on top of that, we have insurance laws that apply to refund requests. And as it says here, an insurance, a health insurance entity shall not be required to correct or pay to correct a payment error to a health care provider if the provider's request for a payment correction is filed more than 18 months after the date that the health care provider receives payment for the claim for the health care insurance entity. And you know, I just received a call this morning from a provider who is receiving a refund request back from 2008. So, you know, yes, they, they know what their requirements are, but they don't always acknowledge them when asking for money back. And because of this particular insurance company that the provider mentioned to me, um, and I've had some other calls and questions regarding this same provider and the same type thing, it kind of leads me to think that this provider has got, you know, fell under that unexpected financial loss and is trying to recover some funds. Um, so another part of this law at the bottom says a health insurance entity that recoups reimbursement to a health care provider under this section shall give the health care provider a written or electronic statement specifying the basis for the recoupment and the statement shall contain at a minimum the information required. Um, so that gives, they have to give you enough time, you know, 30 days so that you can allow for any appeal of that request. This is the area I talked about where the patient, uh, you and the patient, um, may have been impacted uh, detrimentally where uh, theory of, the legal theory of latches is the legal doctrine that a legal right or claim will not be enforced or allowed if a long delay in asserting the right or claim has prejudiced the adverse party or hurt the uh, opponent. So that, that's called the theory of legal legal theory of practice, I'm sorry, um, because, you know, a long delay has happened since, number one, you were originally paid and you relied on that money and have moved forward. And also the patient has paid what they understood their portion to be and now they're being informed uh, that there's an additional amount, so they have been damaged as well. Now here is Tennessee case law. Um, and if you can have case law from your own state, that's even better to use. But uh, Tennessee courts have ruled that insurers are not entitled to restitution for an overpayment when the insured relied on the payments for undergoing treatment and the payment is no longer in the hands of the insured. Now, when we're talking about eligibility retroactive denials, uh, what Tennessee says, the Tennessee law, States, if a health insurance entity or agent contracted to provide eligibility verification verifies that an individual is a covered person and if the health care provider provides services to the individual in reliance on such verification, the health insurance entity may not, therefore, thereafter retroactively deny a claim on the basis that the individual is not a covered person unless such retroactive denial occurs within six months of the date that the health care um, provider, um, I'm sorry, within six months of the date that the health insurance entity paid the claim. Otherwise, the health insurance entity is barred from making such recoupment unless there was fraud by the health care provider. So how many of you knew that law was out there? And how many times have you seen more than six months go by when you have asked, been asked for a refund? Now, even though the Tennessee law gives you a six-month look-back limit and refund period, um, there are some other provider protections that 
we have already covered. And you may recognize this slide, and you may not have it in the slide you're looking at because it is uh, a previous slide in the presentation, but and it's in your document previously. But it clearly says plans and issuers, if you remember, cannot rescind coverage unless an individual was involved in fraud or made an intentional misrepresentation of material facts. And it, it again applies to all rescissions, whether in group or individual insurance market, or whether insured or self-insured coverage applies. So this is a protective measure uh, that kind of overrules that six-month look-back period. Another thing that you have a right to address involving an eligibility retroactive denial is that you as the provider were not or were or are not a, pro a party to any termination of benefits and should not be held accountable to damage resulting from such error. Uh, along with that, since you are the party they are trying to hold accountable for the damage from apparent errors made on the part of either the employer or the insurance company, you can utilize the right of disclosure in requesting to know the full name, position, and employer of the specific person who failed to properly communicate accurate benefit coverage and request to know why that party or entity is not being held financially responsible for any damage incurred as a result of the error. This is Tennessee's Deceptive Trade Practices um, Statute. And it clearly says no person shall engage in the state in any trade practice which is defined in this article as or determined pursuant to this article to be an unfair method of competition or an unfair or deceptive act or practice in the business of insurance. Now, this you might want to consider with some silent PPO activity. Um, should it be an underpayment or that kind of thing. One of my favorite, uh, this is an area, well, let's cover this first and then we'll do the poll question. Um, this is one of my favorite state laws, and all the states actually have this law uh, to some degree. Uh, they all have the law, but different, uh, they address different things. But the majority of the states cover these issues in this law, which involves misrepresentation of benefits, provisions, facts, and related to coverage. So misrepresentation of any benefit um, or uh, coverage. Failure to provide prompt, fair, and equitable settlement of claim. Underpayment of claim. Requiring duplication of claim or medical records already submitted. So how many times have you submitted medical records or claims and then been told that the insurance company did not have them? Um, unreasonable delay of claim investigation, and refusing to pay claims without providing an adequate claim investigation. So all of these are addressed under Tennessee's Unfair Claim Settlement Practices Act, and um, therefore, you know, your appeals, um, any appeal you provide will probably uh, have something within this law that applies to that coverage or denial. Now for the poll question, and I probably have already answered. <laughs> All right. So after reviewing the Unfair Claims Settlement Practices Act, what percentage of claim denials are addressed? 30%, 50%, 80%, or most? And while we've got people responding to that, uh, Colleen, I'm going to go ahead and we, we've got a few more questions from, from our audience, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and present those to you. Uh, first one asks about, in terms of submitting appeals, what is the recourse when an insurance company states they are several months behind in reviewing appeals? Mm, that's where they, you need to, what I do is notify them of what the uh, compliance requirements are involving the 60-day, uh, for an appeal, it's 60-day turnaround time. Okay. Uh, next question. Is the 18-month uh, ERISA timeline, is that always 18 months this person, the state they're in? They've got several statutes uh, that specify 24 months. 
Uh, 18 months and 24 months for, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not understanding what that question is about. So, so the, I think that what they're asking was, um, you know, if they've got state statutes that, that are specific mm -hmm. to 24 months, when does oh. the 18-month the ERISA timeline override or take precedence? What 18-month timeline are we talking about? The, uh, okay, I, th I guess the ERISA 18-month timeline, and, and that's where, since I'm not an expert on any of this stuff. Oh, right. here we go. Oh, is the 18 months a Tennessee timeline as opposed to an ERISA timeline? They just popped in oh, a new question. Oh, for a refund request. Yeah. The, 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 um, the, ten, the Tennessee time, the uh, federal timeline overrules the Tennessee. Okay, so, so. Because of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Gotcha, okay, makes sense. And one more here. Uh, most of these are Tennessee-related statutes. Are you aware of other state statutes? Are there similar rules in other states? And I think you've kind of answered that one, that a lot of these are similar from state to state. Uh, for the Unfair Claims Settlement Practices Act, yes. Uh, like for Georgia, Georgia's is the same, has the same, uh, addresses the same insurer denials. Uh, other states pretty much cover most of these. Uh, the same thing, because they were put together by the uh, National uh, Insurance Commissioners Association, where the, the, the department that the insurance commissioners belong to. Okay, makes sense. All right, so we have got the results from our poll back. Um, it is pretty well split, uh, but a third of the people said uh, approximately 30 percent, and each of the next three answers, 50, 80, and most, all got 22 percent. Um, it would be most denial. So. Most denials are covered under the Unfair Claim Settlement Practices Act, or addressed under the Unfair Claim Settlement Practices Act. Okay. That's why I like the Unfair Claim Settlement Practices Act as a, a state statute. All right, so let's talk about the federal, um, the ERISA, the way ERISA looks at, um, at it. What the ERISA states is under the regulation, an adverse benefit determination generally includes any denial, reduction, or termination of or a failure to provide or make payment in whole or in part paying less than 100% for a benefit. In any instance where the plan pays less than the total amount of expenses submitted with regard to a claim, while the plan is paying out the benefit to which the claimant is entitled, under its terms, the claimant is nonetheless receiving less than the full reimbursement of the submitted expenses. So as it applies to a contract, um, you should be receiving at least your the fee schedule that you have contracted for. Anything less than that would be considered an adverse benefit determination. As it pertains to out-of-network, it's based on, um, as it says here, 100% of the all charges or uh, the total amount of expenses. Now, under ERISA, ERISA claims uh, are they're required. The EOBs are supposed under ERISA. Wait a minute, let me restate that. I'm sorry. ERISA supported EOBs should have all five of these included, which inclu including the specific reason or reasons for adverse benefit determination reference to the specific plan provisions on which the determination is based, a description of any additional material or information necessary for the claimant to perfect the claim, and an explanation of why such material or information is necessary, and a description of the plan's review procedures and time limits applicable to such procedures, as well as a statement of the claimant's right to bring a civil action under Section 502 of the Act following an adverse benefit determination on review. Now, do you receive EOBs that include all five of these? No. However, uh, 
the insurance companies, even though they don't provide you the required EOB meeting ERISA notification requirement, they will utilize ERISA's timely appeal, which is six months. However, if they haven't provided you with the official ERISA notification, then they can't start tolling a six-month appeal time frame until they do provide you with the full notification requirement. So that's just something to think about. Now another good area to use in your appeal process is their own website. Um, I love to get information off of the insurance company websites and use it in my appeals, uh, kind of like their own bullet in my gun kind of thing. Um, but here's an example of a clinical policy bulletin. And if you break this down even more, what you see is things typically will stand out to you. Our medical policy is not your patient's benefit plan. Remember when we talked about the plan versus the policy. Medical benefits are governed and determined by a benefit document, meaning the plan, either a certificate of coverage or a summary plan description. Um, you should rely on the information contained in this website section to determine the insurance med medical benefit. So here it clearly tells you the plan over the policy, although that's not how they word it, of course. Uh, and then a little bit later it states, federal and state mandate and the insurance benefit document, meaning the plan, take precedence over insurance company policy. So as you see, it's kind of varied in there, um, but you can use that to your advantage. So one of the questions I always ask at seminars um, all throughout the day when I'm doing an all-day seminar is, but what about our contract? A lot of people, you, you know, they, they look at the contract as a security blanket, but they never see the area of the contract that provides protection for the provider, a great amount of protection, actually. Um, so what you you need to reference and review is the part of the contract, and all contracts have it, that talk about governing laws. And here is an example of what you will see. Federal law and the applicable law of the jurisdiction where you provide health care services govern our agreement. Such laws and the rules and regulations under them when they are applicable control and supersede our agreement. So basically what that means is any provision in the contract that contradicts the federal law uh, or the uh, plan uh, would supersede, the law would supersede such provisions. So that's your protective measure in your contract. Now, Tennessee and the federal, federal statutes, both ERISA and PPACA, allow for the right of appeal. So utilize that right. Um, it's to your benefit. And the studies have shown that 39 to 50, I think it's like 55 percent of appeals submitted are overturned. The way the federal court looks at it is if you have not appealed, you can't bring a case to court. So you have to exhaust your remedy uh, if you're planning to take a case to court. Now here are some guidelines on how to write an appeal letter. Um, you want to definitely state your understanding of the reason for the adverse benefit determination of denial. Request a copy of the SPD. Um, again, with a valid assignment of benefits, they're required to give it to you upon request. Request specific documentation supporting their decision per disclosure law. State why they should pay and provide documentation that supports your side. Uh, state regulatory and any contract language that would support your case. Uh, request the disclosures uh, that they don't, they, they don't typically like to provide the disclosures, by the way. Um, and request prompt pay and request whether, as well as state or federal interest penalties as applicable. Utilize all the rights that you have. So when you submit a sex successful appeal, what you end up with is a decrease in revenue loss, increase in reimbursement, which we all would like to see, and a gold card status. So what is a gold card status? 
Um, I once had an employee who did the authorizations come to me and asked me what a gold card status was, and I said, you know, I, I said, you mean like a credit card? And she said, no. She said, we apparently are under a gold card status with a particular insurance company, and it was a big name insurance company. And what had happened was I had um, notified them of some compliance requirements that they were uh, failing to abide by. And uh, so what ended up happening was we were put under what they called a gold card status and that uh, the particular things that we were having authorized were to be turned around within a 24-hour period and that only one person would be contact will be handling them and that person would only talk to me um, which were as the manager and not even the, the person that was doing the authorization. So, you know, it was, you know, a little bit of a pain on my part, but uh, I accepted that. <laughs> um, so, now we have questions and answers. Time frame. Time period. All right. So, if anybody's got any questions, if you want to put them into the questions box, um, or you can raise your hand, and I will we'll try the unmuting thing. Sometimes it works. Uh, sometimes it doesn't, um, and so. But I'll go ahead and kick things off here for sure, um, and ask questions specific. Kind of something I see in my area, which is lab charges. Um, for un, we do a lot of stuff with unlisted codes because there just isn't a code to describe what we're doing. Um, so, kind of what's the difference from from an appeals process between you know getting a, a true denial or the payer just saying oh that's an unlisted code and taking a hundred percent contractual you know what, what what's kind of our options as far as appeals go with that well I would go back to the um, the one that talked about the federal law the ERISA law that talked about a um, hundred percent of expenses charge expenses because the way I look at that, in my opinion, um, it is something that I utilize in that unless it falls under the NCCI edit, to me it should be paid based on that particular statute. Okay. Well, thank you. That, consider. <laughs> that will help you. We, we, I just see a lot of that stuff with, um, you know, especially the new molecular and the genetic testing that's coming online, and a lot of that just doesn't have codes and is very costly for us to perform. So, Yeah, and that's the, that's the reason that the AMA has put the unlisted codes in there for that kind of thing until a, a code uh, is provided. So just because it's unlisted doesn't mean that they... Uh, are not required to pay it. Now, let me just say this, though. Medicare and commercial are two different areas. So everything I've covered today, other than the federal interest rate, applies only to commercial. And, and, and that's where the majority of, of the things I'm seeing are because it's a lot of pediatrics patients um, mm -hmm. that, you know, are, that we're ordering genetic testing on. So. All right. And, well, and it's just a delay tactic. I mean, a, a denial tactic. Oh, and and that's what I figured. But you know, it's our, our cost on these things. You know, uh, you know, partial sequencing. I think you know, you're you're talking close to five figures. So, yeah. <laughs> is cost. So. And and that has a lot to do with it. So it's it's mm. their savings uh, denial. Oh tactic. oh yeah. I mean, it's a. I used to work with some chemotherapy, and we saw a lot of the same things. So. Um, we do not have any other other questions that have come in. Colleen, I want to thank you for, for taking the time to be with us here today. This has been, I know, very helpful for me, and I think, you know, based on some of the questions we had earlier, um, has been, been very helpful for our other attendees. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping things and announcements. Um, so everyone who is on here, uh, you will probably get an email uh, later this afternoon um, with a link to go ahead and complete the survey. Um, feedback for, for this webinar if you can take take two or three minutes uh, click that link it's through SurveyMonkey um, it's like two grid questions it shouldn't take you more than a couple minutes and complete that for us also if you missed part of this or want to go back obviously we've got the slides up on our website um, and I've been recording this so we will also uh, get this posted up 
to YouTube in the next day or two um, and add that link back uh, to the website as well so you'll be able to go back that, reference this video for anything, share it with any colleagues um, that you think might have benefited from the information here today. Um, in terms of announcements, we do have registration now open for our Fall Institute. That is October 23rd through the 25th in Gatlinburg and so you can get more information about that by going to thefallinstitute.org um, and I will go ahead and plug I am one of the presenters there I'm doing three hours on database essentials so if that's something you've run into that you need to learn more about or you are frustrated with the people who are supposed to be pulling your data and your reports for you um, I think it'll be a pretty beneficial uh, session and so that's it. Uh, thank you once again for, for coming and send us any feedback that you've got.